I'll go pretty quick through all of this because it's pretty straightforward. Um, most of the time here I want to use for questions because I think most of the value of this is people who have very specific questions about their very specific conditions and maybe I have some information that's helpful to that. So I'll try to save time for that. Um, quick, who I am, I've been in the industry since uh, 1991. I've shipped over 50 games, I've sold tens of millions of units, you can read. Um, I co-founded BoomZap Entertainment. Uh, I think we've been around for about nine years now. We've got 90 people spread across 23 cities, eight nations, 15 project teams. There's 31 original brands that we've done. If you count all of the iPod and Apple SKUs and uh, Android ports and all of that, we've done over 100 SKUs. If you actually divide it up amongst the executable files that we have tested and delivered in those nine years, it's well over a thousand executable files if you consider all of the Android, Dutch, freemium version of Awakening 6, etc. So we've shipped thousands of executable files. We're profitable, have been profitable every year. Uh, we are growing, we have grown every year for nine years. So that's me and my company. Um, so the question is, after I tell you all that, wow, are we actually an indie developer? I mean, I thought indie developers were those guys out there that make games with pixel art and uh, live in the garage with their mom. I have kind of a different definition of independent. Um, here's some dictionary definitions of independent. I'm not going to read them all out because that would be boring and pointless. But the general idea of these definitions is that you are not subject to another's authority, that you're not influenced or controlled by somebody else. You're not dependent on someone else. And I think when we talk about an independent developer, I think this is a misnomer. The idea that you could ever be independent as a developer is impossible. At the very least, right, let's assume that you work in your own garage, you never talk to a publisher, you never talk to a distributor, you never use outsourced material, you program your own game and assembly, you put it on the internet and you, you process the credit cards with a handheld credit card thing. You are entirely independent of everything. Even if you are that grow your own, you are still dependent on an audience. You still have people that you're going to make games for and they're going to have opinions about your games and you're going to have to respond to what they want and what they don't want and what they like and what they don't like. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be in business very long and you're not going to be able to make games very long. Um, that's the most brutal definition of independent I can think of. The vast majority of studios are somewhere far more dependent on the spectrum. Maybe they work with a publisher, maybe they work with distributors, maybe they're using Unity, right? Anyone who's working with Unity, you're not independent, you're working with somebody. There's something that you're depending on. So. I would argue that a indie developer, by my definition, is a developer that remains founder owned, right? You still own your company, you're still able to make the decisions about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do with your company because you don't have to answer to a shareholder, you don't have to answer to somebody who has the authority to tell you that you can or can't make decisions in your company. That would be my definition of an indie developer. Uh, I know many indies will disagree with that definition and I'm sure when this gets posted online the forums would be full of comments from uptight, upset indie developers who tell me I'm a big sellout. But that's my definition and that's what we're working with for the purposes of this talk. So I could go through a big history of the company and what we've done and what we haven't done, but I think that's going to be boring for most people, so I'm probably not going to do that. Instead, I tried to think about when I talk to independent developers, what are the five sort of things that I think we have largely done right, and I'll give you some examples, uh, that I see people doing wrong that allows them to fail as an independent developer. And by fail, I mean run out of money and not are allowed to make games anymore, right? It's a very simple definition of fail. I'm not talking about what's going to make your game win the IGF. I'm not talking about what's going to make you win the fame and fortune of all your friends. I'm talking about what will allow you to continue your life as a game developer, paying your rent, paying your bills, just keeping alive. Number one, cash flow. Um, and this is actually, if I had a top 10 list, this would be number one through five. This is by far the most important thing in your company and it's one of the things that most people get wrong. Now you notice I didn't say cash, I didn't say money, I said cash flow. And the specific definition of cash flow is understanding when you get paid, plotting that out and making sure that you have the money that you need when you need it. When I started BoomZap, I put together my financial forecast sheet in Excel. This was nine years ago. 
That same Excel sheet gets updated by me every week religiously. It, it is what I do. In it, I have all of the costs that I have projected. What am I going to pay for my software? What am I going to pay for my taxes? What am I going to pay for each one of my salaries for the people that are working with me? Right? All of the expenses of my studio are lined up. That's the easy part, right? Because you can pretty well predict most of your expenses. The hard part is predicting where the money comes in, right? Now, if you are an entirely independent studio and you're self-developing and you're self-publishing, you're not really going to get any income until you actually release your title and start seeing revenue from your title. And those revenue projections are extremely difficult to put together, especially if you are doing something really new, especially if you're doing something on a new platform, and certainly especially if this is your first or second game. For us, these revenue projections have been a lot easier. We've worked on a lot of titles. Many of our titles are sequels of titles that we've done before or use gameplay mechanics that we've used before. So it's relatively straightforward for us to do uh, some sort of projection. So the question is, hey, Chris, I'm working on my second game. It's a brand new iPhone game. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. I don't know how much money it would make. Maybe it's a million dollars. Maybe it's $10. I don't know. What do I do? In that case, I would say you have a responsibility as, as a business owner to go do some research, to go look at what other projects that are at least in the same genre of yours, other projects that are the same size of yours, see how they've done. And take those big, huge, you know, Candy Crush style uh, extreme versions of success out of your equations and look at what does the mid-range version of games that look kind of like my games do. And you can, you can back uh, project revenues using sources that are available online. Uh, the, the biggest one, if, if everyone here is not religiously using App Annie, let me suggest to you that you do. You can get a lot of data about where things are, where things are grossing, and you can start to plot some idea of, you know, what is this worth? There are indie mailing lists where people will talk about what certain games have done. If you have a couple of those data points, um, and, and there, are, there are web forums and such where people have shared their revenue numbers, if you can get a couple of those data points, compare them back against historical data on App Annie, you can make some pretty educated guesses as to what games that are similar have done in revenues. This is the most important thing that you will do in your studio, and it's the one thing I see a lot of indies not do. And What's sad is some of them actually make good money, but they make good money at the wrong time. And when they make that good money at the wrong time, they run into three month, four month blocks where they need to pay people, but they can't pay those people because the money doesn't come in for three or four months. And those people leave, and because those people leave, they can't complete the milestone, and because they can't complete the milestone, they don't get the payment, and there's the end of your company. That is one of the most basic stories of failure in the independent game studios that I know. Uh, that, that's the number one reason for failure. And so let me encourage you to think very seriously from the very beginning of your studio about your cash flow. Um, second, um, and again, I will get flamed on the comments when this gets posted on the internet. Uh, innovation is really overrated. If you're making a game and you tell me everything in this game is new, you've never seen anything like this before, I'm going to tell you there's about a 99.999% chance that it will not make money. It's sad, but it's true. So again, uh, all the people out uh, competing in the IGF, well, how do I make new games? You make new games by innovating on things that are important. Um, I actually saw a really good game. Uh, I'll throw out, uh, I wish I could remember the title, and I'm, I'm sure somebody will yell at me later for not knowing. I believe it was called Pieces of Him. It's down in the uh, idea form right now. And it's a really innovative game where they're talking about uh, uh, somebody dealing with the death of his lover. And it, it's very innovative. Uh, it's like nothing I've seen before. But the basic control mechanics of this game are uh, WASD and mouse shooter mechanics. That's how you move around the game. So when I sat down at the game, even though I was about to have a very new, interesting experience, the first thing I did was put my fingers on the WASD, grab the mouse, and I could drive around and I could play the game and I could figure out what I was doing. And it's important that that was not the important part of the game. That was not what mattered, right? How you drove around the game, how you moved, innovating that would not have improved that game in any way. But innovating what you're doing as you're moving around, what you're interacting with, what those things do, that was the point of the game. And it actually was a pretty enjoyable experience. And I, I, I can look at uh, a, good, a good example from our library. The, the biggest success that we ever had, the big breakout success for BoomZap, was a title called Awakening. And the very first Awakening that we did was a, what they call a hidden object puzzle adventure game. And 
we looked at, at the time, the most successful game in the industry was a game called uh, Ravenhurst. It was part of the Mystery Case Files series. And we thought Ravenhurst was a great game. We thought the hidden object parts were great. We thought the puzzles were great. We thought the idea of having a story integrated into this was very innovative and new, and we liked it. And there were millions of people out there playing it and spending a lot of money on it. So we said, let's do something in that genre. Let's have the control mechanics be similar. Let's have the UI be similar. Because innovating on those things would not have improved it, right? But we made a major shift in what is the theme of the game? How do we tell the story in the game? What are the characters in the game? How is this story broken out? That part of the game, uh, all humility aside, I think at the time was quite innovative. And because of that, it was a hugely successful game. People got into it and said, I haven't played a game that looked like this before, but it plays like a game that I've played before. I know how to play it and I know how to have fun. And so that's why I say gameplay it ain't overrated. Gameplay is everything. And when you're playing the game, if the player doesn't understand from the minute he sits down how to interact with it, you're probably going to be a failure. So I encourage you to look at your game designs and make sure that anything that you're actually innovating adds to the quality of the game and anything that doesn't add to the quality of the game, go copy a model that's successful. Don't reinvent the wheel. This is one of the main mistakes I hear from indies. Everybody wants to go out and do it their way. And that's great. I'm sure you have some great ideas. And it's important to the success of the industry that we do have new people come into the industry with new ideas. That being said, this is an old industry. I've been making games for 20 years and there's a lot of people who've been making them longer than me. Those people actually know things and it's probably worth your while to talk to them. And one of the most frustrating things I find uh, with young developers is that when you talk to them, they don't listen. They're there to tell you something. Young developers have this new idea, this new thing, and they want to explain it to you. Let me tell you this great thing. Let me tell you all this great stuff. And you say, you know, actually, I've played something like that, or I've done something like that, or, or you know, there's another game kind of like yours that I saw. But they don't listen. They don't have time for that because they've got some, some shit they got to say, right? And not listening will cost you a lot of money. There are a lot of answers out there. There's a lot of information out there that could save you a lot of money, could save you a lot of heartache. The other thing is, to the people who do listen, one of the things I find, and, and you'll find this as you're in the industry for a while, the rumor mill is very strong in this industry. And every now and then there will be some, some common wisdom of the industry. We, we, the industry, have decided that X is Y. And everybody says X is Y. And because it sounds smart and it sounds intelligent and you get into a conversation and you want to sound like you know what you're saying, you repeat back something that somebody else said as though it were true. And when enough people do that, it becomes common wisdom, regardless of whether or not it's right or wrong. I would suggest when you hear things, you should compare it to things that you know. You should compare it to things that you've heard from other people. And you should question it. And specifically, I will give you a hint, I, I was just talking to somebody who had a, a very interesting, this is literally 30 minutes ago, had a very interesting new way that he was uh, uh, doing uh, monetizing advertising. And I thought it was an interesting thing, but when he first started talking to me, I didn't really understand it. And I felt, and, and, and here's a human thing, as a human I felt stupid. I felt like, he's telling me this thing and maybe a smarter person than me would understand what he just said, but I don't understand and I don't want to look stupid. Stop ask some questions, and the way that you ask the question is, I'm a user. I'm a guy playing this game. Can you explain to me how, as a guy playing this game, this thing that you're talking about will work? How does this new ad monetization process work? How does this new betting system that you've put together work? From the point of view of the player, what do I see as a player? How does this play out? If you can get to that level of understanding, now you can ask intelligent questions about, okay, on the back end, in the technology, how do I make that function in the way that you just explained to me? That particular way of asking questions is a very fast and very effective way of getting to the root of some of these game design issues, some of these new technology issues. And especially right now with the change to free to play, with the change to mobile, with the change to all these huge changes that are happening in the industry. Even people like me that have made games for a very long time are kind of lost on some of the new things that are happening. We don't fully understand them. This is a way to get there. And the last thing I would say about this is learn to disbelieve. Some of these people are completely full of shit. This is true. It's sad, but it's true. And if your gut tells you that the person who's talking to you is full of shit, there's a good chance they might be. 
And it's probably worth your while to go take that information to some other people that you trust, repeat that information back out, have a discussion about it, and figure out if that is true or isn't true. Just because some guy who's older than you or has a fancier watch than you or whatever tells you that this thing is true, it's not necessarily true. And, and, and it could be because they don't understand or it could be because they're genuinely disingenuous and they're trying to rip you off. Both of those cases happen a lot in this industry and you would be wise to have a certain level of disbelief and to use questioning and use talking to other people and using comparisons of things you know to have that level of disbelief. This is kind of a harsh one and uh, my friend Juan Grill told me that the second part was maybe a bit too harsh but let me walk you through what I'm trying to say here. You're going to put together a team. I have 90 people on my team. I work under the assumption that the success of my company and the success of my team equates to the success of those people. I create a system financially in the way that I reward people in the way that we work in our company that my success equals their success. And at some level I have to just take a deep breath, take it on faith that the people who are on my team, my people, my company, I can trust them. Right? Because if you don't do that you're going to spend your whole life doing everybody else's job for them. You have to be able to say, look, this thing is your job, you're the, you're the person who knows this part of the code, you're the chief coder, this is your call, I trust that you made the right call. Now you can look at it, you can have conversations about it, but at the end of the day, if you're constantly questioning everything that the people on your team are doing, either you have a shit team or you're pissing off a good team because you're telling them how to do stuff they know how to do better. I would suggest not doing that. Start with the, build a team and start with the assumption that you can trust and, and assume the best of the people who are on your side. Everyone outside of your company assume the worst of them. And I know that sounds really, really harsh, right? But there are publishers out there, there are distributors out there, there are ad agencies, there are uh, user acquisition specialists. All of these different people have their own agendas. There is a win condition for them. And their win condition at certain times in their lives will be aligned to yours. But they will not remain aligned to yours. And a publisher or a distributor or any company in the world is not capable of being your friend. They're not humans. They're organizations. Organizations don't have friends. Now there might be a dude at that organization who's a pretty cool dude. He could even be your friend. But at the end of the day, that guy has a responsibility to his team. That guy has a responsibility to his family. And those responsibilities will always outweigh the responsibility that they have to you and your team. And when push comes to shove, if it's between him losing his job, or her losing her job, I don't mean to necessarily say it's a guy, if it's between him losing his job, or him having to fire people in his studio, or him losing money in his studio, he will always choose to fire your guys, shut down your project, destroy your company. That will always be the decision that they make. I don't care how nice they are, I don't care if they're your brother. If they're not within your organization, that will be the choice that they make. Does that mean you have to be a big jerk and yell and scream and oh everybody's evil? No. This is just the reality of the world and you have to put your business together in such a way that you are protected against that. I know a lot of people they're like, oh do I need to get a lawyer? How do I read contracts? You need to learn how to read contracts and the way that you read contracts is you assume everything that happens in your business goes wrong. You assume the game doesn't ship. You assume somebody gets sued. You assume that the people you sign the contract with all get fired and are replaced with brand new people. You assume the worst of everything. You assume the absolute worst of their people. You assume that their vice president got fired and replaced with the biggest douchebag in the world who wants nothing else but to destroy your company. You make those assumptions when you put your contract together. And you put protections for yourself into contracts for that. And 99% of the time you will never look at the contract again and it will never be an issue. But 1% of the time is where your company gets destroyed. This is the last one that I will talk about. Indies need to learn how to accept failure. They need to learn how to learn from their failure and they need to learn how to move on. And this is something that was hard for me to learn. You put a lot of time and energy into a project. You love this project. This is the product of your creative will. This is something you cared about. I built this thing and I thought it was going to be a great idea and I told all my friends about it and if it's not cool, what kind of idiot do I look like? If I just work on it another two months, it's going to be better. I know I released it and it only sold four copies, but I think if I change all the colors and put a new UI on it, it's all going to be better. No. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. 
Failure is failure. Smart people mess up, right? The best game developers you can think of, the smartest game designers you can think of, every one of them has failures. Not just failed products, but failed parts of good products. Every product I've worked on has failures in it. At some point, you have to be able to look at your project and say, dude, this was a bad idea. I thought it was a good idea, but it was a bad idea. I've only got X number of years in this industry before I get old and die, and I probably should use those years to build something that doesn't suck. That's a hard thing for indies to learn. Um, and that's actually it, I think. Um, those are my main points. And I know that was brief, and I know some of it seemed quite basic, but if you got all of that right as an indie, if you fixed all of those problems as an indie, from my experience mentoring indies, working with independent developers, and more than 20 years of independent game development, I've never worked for a publisher, I've always been an independent game developer. Um, in those years, if you had done all those things right, if I had done all those things right, you will be more successful than 90% of the people out there. So that's what I got. Um, questions are free. I'm happy to answer them. I think I got a couple more minutes up here. Where, where are we at? I got like 10 minutes. I got three minutes up here to answer questions. I'll also be out in the hall if anyone's got any more. Um, and then obviously there's my uh, email address. That's what they call those. There's my email address. And you're welcome to mail me. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. There's no other Chris Natsume on Facebook or LinkedIn. So you're happy to add me on either one of those. Questions, anyone? A few years back, you published a great article about uh, how, how you ran Boom's app and, and, and it's distributed all over the world. It was a terrific article and, and uh, inspired me and a lot of other people who read that article. Are there things that you would say have changed since back when that article was published? One the thing. Tools that you would say added or changed in that mix? Obviously, the world has changed a little bit. Uh, BoomZap is still 100% virtual. Uh, we are now spread across 23 different cities. Um, we're more diverse than we have ever been. Um, I'm proud to say that 40% of our studio is female, um, including many of our leads. Um, so I think we, we have grown and we have diversified as a studio. What has changed in that time, honestly, doesn't change anything I said in that article. Okay. Um, what is different now than before, I would encourage you at uh, Casual Connect in Singapore, I gave another uh, talk, um, uh, it, and it was a panel with Juan Grill and Jan Marshall and Ian Gregory, all very good independent developers. And we talked about the current state of the publishing model. And if anything has changed radically between that time and now, most of it was covered in that discussion uh, that's available on the Casual Connect website. I encourage you to go watch that. It's actually, uh, you know, I, I think I had some useful things to say. I think the other guys on the panel had even more useful things to say. Um, but the, the short version of it is, wow, publishing is totally different now than it used to be. And if you don't understand that, you're in a world of hurt. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Regarding staying virtual versus staying on a one roof, like if you had to I will never start a studio under one roof again. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, being virtual uh, for us, allow, the biggest thing is it allows us to find staff where nobody else can hire staff. I have guys in Bandung, I have guys in Solo, I have guys in Iloilo City. Most people don't even know where those places are. There certainly isn't a game industry there. And for many of those people, they've had the personal choice to either leave their family, leave their friends, leave everything they know, leave a place that's very cheap to live, and go move to a place like Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, that's much more expensive, where they don't know anybody, or not work in games. We've been able to give them a, a second choice, which is stay home, live with your family, live in your environment, uh, increase the wealth in your local environment, uh, and still work in the game industry. By far, that's the, the most important part of why we do what we do. Um, it is important for us Working in the developing world especially, about 40% of our staff uh, lives in and around Manila where the infrastructure is terrible and commuting can be a two hour in, two hour out event every day. That's four hours a day that people get back and that doesn't even count the time saved in you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the dentist, you have to pay some bills, all of that. That's a day long event in some of those places. Um, being able to be home allows you to do that substantially more efficiently. Uh, 
The third is obviously uh, being able to have people in places like uh, Bandung allows them to live in much lower cost of living locations. I would encourage people who are doing that not to think of that as an excuse to pay your staff shit wages. Uh, we actually pay a flat wage, so I pay the people in Bandung the same that I pay people in Kuala Lumpur or Manila. And we do that because that's fair and equitable. But the upside for us as a business is it means people who live in those low cost of living locations live incredible lives compared to what other people could expect to earn in those areas. And that means we have huge retention. Uh, we have very few people quit the studio, and having that kind of retention allows you to build huge capacity and knowledge base within your studio. Those are the upsides. Um, the downside, the biggest one, if you're in the developing world, the infrastructure sucks balls. Uh, we have people that lose internet for days on end, we have people who don't have power, and because it's so distributed, it's not something that I can do anything about. I can't go fix the internet in Banda Ake. <laughs> right? Um, that's something that, that, that's a huge issue for us and um, we have to build a pipeline that deals with that. I, and I can, I can give you some more details of how we do that if you're more interested, but it's a longer thing than I have time for. That's, that's the big downside. The, the other thing that you expect, that it's hard to talk to people and it's hard to collaborate, we haven't had much trouble with that, quite honestly. I think I'm out of time, so I got to go. I'll be out in the hall if anyone has any other questions. And uh, thank you very much. I know it's late on the last day, and thanks for, thanks for being here.